experience is how you got to the destination. Okay. Deshwanshi Lewis, Deshwanshi Carol, thank you very much for joining us for this uh, session this morning about Sajirga Golden Memories. Um, so let's start with uh, Lewis. Um, could we? Could you tell us about how you met Sri Mataji? Where was it and when was it? What was it like? Please. That was uh, quite a dramatic uh, situation for me to meet Sri Mataji. Uh, Sri Mataji came to Portugal uh, already in 1980, see, but uh, she came mostly, she gave a public program, no doubt, but she also went to the wedding of. Um, uh, Maria Amelia and Arnaud de Calbermatten, they got married in Portugal and Shimataji was invited to that wedding, so she came to Portugal and uh, they took some photographs of Shimataji during that wedding and then in Lisbon somehow the photographer put the photograph of Shimataji in the in the shop window of his photographic studio you see, so um you see, I, I was so lucky that I was I had to go to to that to sit outside that shop for a long, long time, you know. So I was always looking at uh, Shimataji's photograph without having any knowledge that this is Shimataji or that she's a, a great guru, nothing. I didn't know anything. So this was one of the great coincidences that happened for me, although I missed Shimataji's arrival in Portugal, I, you know, somehow I never heard of it. Uh, life brought me, you know, to sit next to that photograph of mother. So I had to go and visit a, a lawyer before I was doing a law course and there were so many exams, oral exams, written exams. And before the exams, we used to go and meet a certain lawyer who used to be a teacher of law. So he used to give us some, uh, some help and prepare us for the exam, give us some uh, kind of a, a great lesson and instructions for the exam. But uh, he was very busy with important clients and we had to sit outside waiting for him to call us when he was free. So we were sitting outside in front of that shop in which there was uh, Shimataji's photograph. And Shimataji's photograph was in the middle of the shop as the most important person that photographer ever did the photographs. And so there was nothing to look at. And so we were there waiting, you know, looking at mother's photograph, not having a clue who, who this lady is. And uh, this was helping our exams a lot. And we thought, because this lawyer is so amazing, but now in retrospect, we understand uh, getting, a, you know, this darshan of mother's photograph was very, very good for our exams. So we always wanted to go and see that lawyer before our exams, you know, thinking it, it, was, the, it was the lawyer was a genius. And uh, this lawyer was married to a lady from Goa, an Indian lady who also had this, uh, the red, uh, you know, the red the mark on the forehead. His wife also had that because she's from Goa, from, from India. And um, this colleague of mine was there with us. She, she used to say, look, look at this lady. Look at the dot on the forehead. Very important. Look at the dot. It was black and white, the photo. So the, the dot was not red. Because when you see my aunt, she used to say, because it's red, you see. When you see it in real life, this dot is red, and you are going to stare at the, at the dot, and then you are going to talk about that and ask her, what is this? And is it blood? Or what? And she gets so upset, she'll throw us out. So here is a good case. Look at this lady here. Look at the dot. You are acquainted with it. When you see her, don't even stare at the dot, you know, just otherwise she'll throw us out. So this was happening to us. So, I mean, over two years, I was going through this ritual, you know. And, two years. Yeah, two years we were sitting oh. inside, you know, <laughs> looking at mother's photograph ever so often, you know, for a long time. Sometimes we had to wait an hour before the lawyer was free to see us. He had important clients, you know, and there was nothing to look at. And we were looking at mother's photo and uh, it was helping our exams a lot, but we had no idea. Wow. And so this is just a small coincidence. Another small coincidence is that there were only two Saj yogis in, in Portugal and I knew them both. But they decided, uh -huh. they decided I was not uh, the right person to introduce to Sahara. She never told me about it. So still, you know, how am I going to, to meet Sri Mataji, you know, or to find out who she is or that she exists even. But mother has ways of, uh, if you are a seeker of truth, mother finds a way to bring you there. 
Meanwhile, in my own family, well, this is what I see confirmed. She said, we are all born realized souls in our family, my parents, my sisters, myself, and we're all seeking, no doubt. But um, suddenly my mom started going to certain groups, you know, where they had very strange ideas about Christ, you know. And mm -hmm. I, I felt this was so bad for me to hear those things from my mom that I said, mom, in future, we don't ever speak about spirituality because I'm afraid I don't want to lose my faith in Christ by listening to certain things like this, you know. Okay. So, so that was a rift. So <clears throat> as it happens, my mom was the first person to, and my father, to meet Sri Mataji. Not me, you know. And we had this deal between us that now we don't talk about spirituality anymore, you know. How old were you then? I was uh, 22 then. Uh, and what year was this, if I may ask? 1982. That's another Thank time. You know, this, when Shimataji came to Portugal again in 1982, then I met Shimataji. But uh, there were these barriers, these obstacles for me to meet Shimataji. I had this deal, this agreement with my mom that um, we don't speak about spirituality ever again, you know. And then if any group she goes to attend, I don't want to go, see, because I felt uh, she was meeting certain groups that were very, very bad, bad level, you know, not really correct. I was also meeting lots of wrong gurus myself, even worse ones than my mom. But I thought mine were better. So yes. we had this agreement, you see. So when Shimataji, when my mom met Shimataji, you know, this was uh, like a breach of our agreement. Another agreement I had with my parents is that I will never go to jail to meet my cousin because I'm studying law. I'm a lawyer. I don't want to mix with criminals. And my parents were appalled. This is your family. This is your cousin. How can you not visit uh, your cousin, you know, is going to offend your aunt very much, you know, who loves you so much. How can you do that? You have a family duty and a Christian duty also. And I said, no, no, I was like a fanatic, you know, we must never mix with criminals, you know. Uh, I was Sorry, thinking, this cousin is, uh, and this aunt is your father's sister or your mother's sister? My father's then? sister. She's my father's your mother. Sister. From okay. my father's side, she's a... Uh, and um, so, you know, I was never going to go to jail, you see. So my parents started going to meet my cousin in secret without telling me. Now, okay. so this is a huge problem now because they, my mom, you know, is reluctant to talk to me about Saj Yoga now. And uh, that day they were going to meet Sri Mataji again, having met her just the night before, but they were going to jail first to meet my cousin. So how can they bring me? We can't even talk about this. But uh, somehow mother made a, made a miracle. This is the greatest miracle. When they came back, having seen Shimataji, they arrived home very late. It was about 3 a.m. And my mom just, my mom went into my bedroom, opened the door, put the light on, put the photo of Shimataji on my face <laughs> and told me, this is the lady you've been looking for all your life, you know, <laughs> you know. And yes. I, I was so afraid, you know, but I said, no, please take this photograph out of this room. Otherwise I can't <laughs> sleep. You know, I'll be afraid to sleep. I'll be afraid of ghosts or something yeah. like that. Wow. But, but my mom doesn't take, uh, you know, instructions from me, you know. She put the photo on the, on the shelves there in my bedroom. And that night for the first time, I slept without, I slept like in paradise and Jesus Christ appeared in my dream. Now this wow. is... It never happened to me. I have been praying to Christ and the Virgin Mary all my life. We were Catholics. I was always reading the Bible. And Christ never, ever appeared in my dreams, you know. The Virgin Mary had appeared in my dreams, but not Christ. So the, for the first time, Christ appeared in my dream and he talked. I didn't see him, but he talked. And this, this is the, the Maya, how I went, I managed to see Mother. I had the, all these obstacles, you know. I knew the people, but they didn't tell me about Sahaj. I had seen mother's photo. I didn't know this was mother's photo. <laughs> you know, I couldn't talk. To my, my mom didn't want to speak to me about spirituality anymore. But after meeting mother, Shimataji, my mom felt, okay, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell him this. And so in the, in the dream, Christ appeared in my dream and he said these words from the gospel, you know, that uh, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no water. I mean, I had no clothes, you gave me no clothes, you know. I was ill, you never came to visit me. I was in jail, and you never came to visit me either. This is the words in the gospel. Christ is saying this to the disciples. And the disciples replied to Christ saying, Oh no, Master or Rabbi, 
we never did that to you. And Christ replies, yes, every time you do this to others, you are doing it to me. You know, this that that philosophy of Christ, oneness, you do it even to children, you are doing it to me. Whatever you do, or the slightly least important person on earth, you do these things to them, you are doing it to me. So these words of Christ in my dream, I was thinking, I'm going to say the same like the disciples to Christ. I'm saying, what has this got to do with me? I never did this to Christ, you know. And then I thought about it and started, I couldn't take the words from my mind. And suddenly I realized, oh my God, this applies to me. I refused to go and see my cousin in jail, you know. So that day I told my parents, I need to go and see my cousin in jail now, today. And my parents said, well, we were going to go in any case, except we hadn't told you because you get upset with us. <laughs> and on the way back, we are going to see that lady, the lady Mataji, you know. And um, that's how it happened. So I, I mean, I really wanted to go and see my cousin in jail because I got that message from Christ in my dream. This happened after seeing mother's photograph in the night because my mom put the photograph to my face, you know. And uh, on the way back from jail, we went to see Shimataji. In fact, uh, when I saw Shimataji, she told me, you know, one of the first things she told me is, go and see your cousin in jail. And I was really shocked. How can mother know about this, you know? <laughs> in fact, Shimataji even knew that I don't usually go and see my cousin in jail. But luckily for me, I could say, today, for the first time, I've been to see him in jail, you know. And mother said, All right, go back again. And this time, raise his kundalini, you know, raise his kundalini. Wow. It was frightening to see how mother knew everything about my life <laughs> and all the small details. She even knew that I must go to jail again to meet my cousin, you know, and raise his kundalini. And that's how it happened. So we, I met Shimataji at long last, you know. And uh, what an experience, you know. It was really, I mean, I had so many problems in life at that time. And mother started working on all my problems, you know one of the i had a very serious problem i was uh, involved with a girlfriend and um i had been for two years and i wanted to get rid of her you see but that was very dangerous because in portugal you know sometimes if you have been going out with a girl for two years you know now you are supposed to marry really otherwise okay. the relatives might come and break your legs or something and uh and she was a member of a political party, and the, her brother was a very prominent person in that party. It was a very aggressive political party, where they put bombs under the cars of people and kill people even, you know. So many members yeah. of the party had been taken to jail for criminal acts of, of violence, you know, very dangerous people. Her father was also quite dangerous, in fact. So I was afraid to terminate the relationship with her because fear of the family. I didn't have the courage to go and tell the parents that I want to put an end to this or how to solve this. But uh, it, to me, it was a serious problem, this uh, girlfriend issue, mm. because she was atheist and she wanted to convert me to communism. I was, of oh. course, a very religious person. For me, life without God, without religion is impossible, you know. So yeah. it's such a bad relationship you have here where she's trying to convert me and I'm trying to convert her, all we do is fight. This is not going to be a successful marriage. So I wanted to discuss this matter with her family to see what's the solution. Either she converts to my religion, which is religion of God, or because I will never convert to communism or, or any philosophy without God, you see. So we have a problem and we may have to split, you know. But I didn't have the courage to face them up. I was afraid they might kill me or break my legs, you know. Something. Um but you. Somehow, Shimataji saw this girl and immediately, you know, she was sitting next to me. Who is this girl? What is she doing here? Of course, because she's an atheist, she was there. I brought her that day by force, you know, against her will even. She didn't want to come, you know. And Mother knew, I mean, she, she should not be here because she doesn't be, even believe in God. She's an atheist and she's against this, brought by force, you know. And then I had to confess, well, Mother, she's here because I brought her, you know, she's my girlfriend, you know. And then mother goes straight to the point, you know, and she asked me the question, do you love her? Of course I didn't. It was just, all you did was fighting and I wanted to get rid of her. By hook or by crook, I just was afraid to face the music with her parents and brothers, you know, they were very dangerous. And mother asked me the question, I don't have an answer to this, uh, to this question, you know. And she asked me a second time, do you love her or not? 
you know, and no answer. I was just like, as if I can't speak, you know. And then mother asked me a third time, do you love her or not? I've asked you a question. And, and the answer came, the truth. No, I don't love her at all. Well, mother is that what? You don't even love her? So what is this? This is very indecent, you know. Very indecent, you know. It's not the way to treat a lady even, you know. If you don't love her, stop the relationship immediately. Or if you love her, marry her. This is not uh, the right, you know, proper way to do things, you know. So mother gave me that courage. Okay, I have to go and speak to her family. And I thought, this is going to be a very dangerous thing to do. But, you know, I still did it. You know, five days after meeting mother, I went to meet her family. I felt inspired. I'm going to do what she told me to do. I spoke to a family. And again, I started saying, I mean, this girl will have to convert to my religion. There's no way I will never convert to a religion, this, that, you know, this wedding will never work. I was preparing the grounds for us to stop. And she says, by the way, I will never marry you. You are a horrible person to me. And I said, oh, my God, that's it. How easy. <laughs> the, the interview was over. She refused to marry me for being such a horrible person and refusing to convert to the right philosophy of communism and all that, you know. And I was so afraid to face the music with the family. And she herself terminated it for me at long last. And so mother saw what was for me a great problem. I was afraid for my life in case I dumped her and the family felt offended by this. So everything went okay. Mother was already working on my inner problems, my fears, giving me the courage to do the right thing and the right behavior. It was an extraordinary thing to meet mother, but this, this goes on forever. I thought today, of course, then mother gave me self-realization. She asked me to translate because she was working on other people. And uh, at that time, I remember saying, thank you, Mr. Blake, you know, thank you, Mr. William Blake. You know, I felt it's such a privilege to be allowed to stand next to Srimatasi at a very small distance of about 10 centimeters while mother was working on new people, people who had met mother before on previous occasions had come. And mother was talking to them and she asked me to translate. So I was sitting, standing so close to mother and I felt the power, the energy, the cool vibrations coming from her. It was something extraordinary. And uh, the reason why I had decided to learn English was in order to be able to read the books of William Blake. So I was uh, a great admirer of William Blake. Also, about two years before coming to Sahaja, I'd been uh, trying to study William Blake, his books, you know. And How did you come across William Blake then? Because <laughs> you were in Portugal, you didn't know, sort of you weren't an English scholar at that point. You were a lawyer, uh, a no. very um, ethical and uh, very moral, a very strongly moralistic uh, young person. Yes. Where did you come across Blake first then? I had some friends who were studying philosophy and uh, they knew about oh. Blake. And when they, they knew also I was very interested in the Bible, and so was one of my friends. And because Blake, William Blake is a Bible illustrator, he has done amazing paintings of, of Christ and the Old Testament, you know. So yeah. they knew that this would be something I like. So they showed me the books. And that's when I decided I have to learn English now properly in order to be able to read William Blake because it's so difficult, you know. So Brilliant. Uh, so when I met mother and because I could speak English, I was invited to translate for her. I felt that was such a privilege to sit there next to mother. I felt such waves of joy and bliss coming from her. You know, it was the most powerful experience. And I said, thank you, Mr. William Blake, because it's the reason, <laughs> the reason why I've seen I that before you thanking William Blake. <laughs> so it came out of me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I thought, so the interest in William Blake had been there for, for a while, you know. Fantastic. It was helping me already then. Ah, oh. okay. Thanks for that, Louis. Can can we um, address this question to Carol now? Carol, you've been, um, uh, if you could share your journey of how and when and where you were when you first uh, met mother and what was it like to meet Shramataji and to get your self-realization because like in India we have a sort of I think it's just ingrained in us naturally you know the deities the uh, that there is God uh, and things like that what was it like that for you here in the west in England in particular 
That's an interesting question. And it's been really, I mean, I've listened to Lewis obviously quite a lot with all his um, remembrances and things, which are so enjoyable and wonderful to, to learn from. And But it's yeah. just made me realize how this time talking about it, that he was seeing mother's face first time in 1980s. And I think in the 1980s, I, in 1980, um, I was, um, I was starting to be conscious that I needed something. And I, I what I was, was I'm looking back, I, for a long time now I've realized it is because I actually saw a poster of mother on a shop window. It was one where mother's um, got her hair all out here like this, quite sort of, it's quite a dramatic uh, photo which was used on that poster. And it was just a sort of photocopied black and color print, um, not like we do nowadays. Mm. And um, I had never, because I had been brought up in, in a, a, a very Christian missionary family, uh, my parents were missionaries in India, and I was born, oh, okay. <laughs> which was a great privilege for me to be born yes. in India. And um, oh, you were born in India? I didn't know that. Yes, yeah. Oh, so there's a bit of a a story about that which I'll, I'll come to, which has to do with mother. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so I just interesting to see that in sort of Louis was looking at mother's photo, and I by chance had seen mother's photo. Um, yes. And um, I just needed time to sort of get myself a bit away from um, the, the church, I'm not saying Christian Christianity, but the church. I'd, I'd stopped going, but I knew there was a gap in my life. I was having a lot of emotional problems. And um, my, you know, I, I was doing my second degree in landscape architecture, ma master's degree. It was very hard work. And I'd had lots of um, quite intense relationships, which had should have where people asked me to marry them, and I either said no because I just somehow knew they weren't the right person, or finally I said yes because I thought they seemed to be the right person, but in my heart something always told me this is not right for you, and I had to always back out. And then right. the final time I felt so bad about that. I said, Mother, how can I? Well, not it wasn't mother. I think to myself because I hadn't met mother. How can I do this to somebody? How can I do this to somebody? This is so appalling. I feel so ashamed of myself. Now, in retrospect, I think this sort of seeking and looking inside myself had come from um, seeing mother's photograph, as Lewis has said, how mother's photograph started, working on the things which would stop us from coming to Saj Yoga, if mother hadn't done that for us, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so I started reading books that I'd never read before. I started uh, skipping out of my work, which I was doing a job then to go and look for books. And um, I found one book which said, what you need is a guru. I thought, yes, I need a guru, I need a guru. Also, I had um, been reading the Bible again and uh, Christ's parables and things too. So I thought I'll read it myself for myself, nobody telling me you know, what I should think about what it was. And um, Christ says in that, um, that uh, the, um, well, it's like, I can't remember the exact, but it's to do with the, com that the, he's going to send a comforter. There's going to be something else to be there. And I started thinking, gosh, would I have recognized Christ at that time? Will I recognize him if he comes again? And I thought, mm, this is, <laughs> and also there's these other par other um, stories that Christ says, you know, you, you must forget, you must follow me and forget about your family. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not sure I, I will be able to do that. And it's um, probably still something which I find a bit difficult. Um, uh, but somehow mother was sorting all this out. It came to a head, really came to a head. Um, and I was just so distraught that I, I tried going back to the church. I tried other things. I tried the Baha'is, uh, which was hopeless because they didn't even really believe in Christ, which they're meant to believe everything. 
um, and um, I went into a church just because I just needed something. There was a, a statue of the Virgin Mary there, and I just started crying. And it wasn't, it was a Catholic church because my family's Protestant. And <laughs> so actually mother said when she first, uh, quite uh, soon after we were married, we saw mother in Brighton at the railway station. Yes. And we saw mother, she was walking away and, and she was just smiling and she was rubbing her hands together like this and she was laughing at us. And it was just like she knew that this Catholic and Protestant bit was going to have to be sort of uh, worked out between us in some way. <laughs> And <laughs> uh, so she was always, you know, it's just when you look back like this, it's such a privilege because it makes you start to think how much, how much mother's been there all the time, how many times she's tried, given us an opportunity to do something we sort of somehow said, oh, no, it's not going to be that. Not physically, she's told you, but yeah. something's come up and you haven't really quite. But then she gives you another way of doing it. And it's just endless you know never ends how mothers helped us in every single way um but seeing this statue of the virgin mary it was in this catholic church it just i just sort of opened my heart and just cried you know and then sometime after that friend of mine in a shared house i was living in they, they said oh carol you've been looking at all sorts of things and you've been going around to all sorts of different things you should try this we've just been to this amazing program this thing you know you should see what you feel it's incredible what you feel you know you must come with us next week so I went with them the next week and of course it was the size yoga program and um uh, this was in Sheffield and uh I just felt that you know the things that were, they were saying at the intro introduction and then the tape of mother where mother was talking was just amazing and because I've been doing this landscape architecture it's all about planning and thinking and everything and mother said you don't have to plan anything you can just God just put a tree there a river here uh, think, I was thinking wow oh, fantastic you know amazing uh, and then um, the two side yogis who worked on me uh, Gail Pottinger and, and John Glover you know to give me my realization they were they were fantastic you know his candle they used everything I started crying and everything they said it's all right you know don't worry uh your heart's opening don't worry and um then they sort of um they said can you feel it can you feel it on your hands can you feel it above your head and I said mm, you know I I I was very scientific as well, a lot of mental of activity. So this thing about the English and the mental activity can be such a, you know, one side, the other side, one side, the other side. And um, then I said, uh, they said, well, or anything else, what we can feel? I said, oh, I can feel it, something coming cool down onto my knees. Oh, they were almost clapping and saying, oh, thank God, you know, you, you're <laughs> it, sort of thing. So very quickly, I sort of was absorbed you know into into the, the Sahaj community in Sheffield and it was was great and they were sort of teaching me everything the next opportunity to go down to London to meet Sri Mataji um but we did um, so you don't you were in Sheffield uh, by virtue of studying uh, yes. landscape architecture yes. Yes. and what was your first degree in uh, because yes English scholarship is is renowned isn't it so um just curiosity what was your first degree botany when did you do zoology botany and zoology I did in London in uh, King's College um, oh, okay. and I, but actually then I decided I wanted to do landscape architecture Sure. Um, but uh I, which I had been playing around with since I was at school um yeah there's lots of lots of detail about that but it's not um you know but somehow mother kept me on that track um because I think that was an auspicious yes to have and um also that um it it was something that I could work at through my life, which I I, I did. Um, so, um, but in fact, when mother phoned up to arrange our wedding, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. She said- No, to, no, all right, carry on. She said to me, um, 
you know, she said various things. She said, oh, yes, and you know, both of you, you've got this similar education. He's he's come from a very good family with a lot of education and you come from a, a family with education. Uh, your education level is sort of similar. I think that will be, um, you know, would be a good idea. Uh, Mother said some other things as well, which I'm happy to repeat later on, but uh, it's not part of this question, really. <laughs> um, but it was true. And Lewis had done six year law degree in Portugal with um a mother told me that he was a, a scholar and that I should help him um, to be a, be a scholar, you know, to continue in scholar, scholarly way. And um, that he was, um, that, that he had studied the six years law because it, it was, he wanted to get to the truth. And mother yeah. taught him in London, eventually mother sort of had been thinking, should he, should he do a degree in law? Should he do a, a um, a job in law in the UK should he um, continue with that I mean he did become qualified totally for doing law in this country but that was really just to sort of round it all off but mother said in the end to him no you shouldn't do law here because it's uh it's, com it's full of it's completely yeah. corrupt it's completely corrupt it's really yeah. corrupt Lewis yeah. was surprised because he thought that this was a country which had honor and good things and she couldn't see the corruption. But I mean, those things are part of this country, but they have been completely- They're very subtle. Yes, they've been undermined. Um, yeah. So um, the, that finally I met mother- So the question that just came up was like, okay, it's, it's, it's very good. You were so, so much into um, progressing your learning and accomplishing things. How did you deal with the thoughtlessness that came with being in Srimadji's presence? What was it like? Uh, so, uh, yes, well, that's, this is where the next bit of the story about me meeting mother in person. Yes. Was that, Puja in Chelsham Road, um, one of the ones which has come sort of towards the end of the summer or into early autumn. I can't honestly remember which puja it was. Mm -hmm. There were a lot, lot of, you know, there's a lot of pujas coming through that period. And I went to the two, three of them in quite quick su succession. The first one I went to um, after the puja was finished, we were invited to go up to Mother's Feet. Um, but all through the puja, I was sort of in mother's talk. I was looking at mother and I was at sort of mother's used to sit next to the fireplace and I was sort of on the back walls directly sort of in front of mother there, but some distance away. And um, I kept thinking, who are you? And I asked this when I went to the Sheffield program, who is this lady? I say, who are you? And um, when I got home, then I thought, I know who you are. That was... Next time I went for pujas again, I, I, and I went to Mother's Feet, and there was some conversation then as well. Um, and when I came back, I felt, well, I just love you, Mother. And I think... There wasn't a question for me about thinking about any of that. I, I had already sort of used some rationalization about things. I've been to a meeting where um, Ray Harris's mother, Mrs. Harris, had said, well, you, you know that um, you know that they say that uh, Shumataji is a reincarnation of uh, the Virgin Mary. And I sort of thought to myself, well, that's possible. That's possible. You know, I was sort of being quite scientific about those things then. Yes. So. But it didn't it it didn't hamper me at that time. At it's all. the experience probably that uh, overtook the brain, was it? I think so. And in the early years and getting married and everything, uh, it completely yes. overtook it. If anything, since I've, I that's a good question. But it does it does. If one doesn't meditate, if it goes too long without doing some Sahaj techniques or goes too long without going to the collective, then if you're not careful and you don't know what, if you not, haven't realized what it is and it takes quite a long time sometimes to realize what's going on and, and still it gets subtler and subtler, this sort of play. Um, 
yes yeah. especially at that time I mean even now it's not so um easy but Srimataji being the all-powerful and and the supreme goddess in a Mahamaya form as a as just you know as as a as a, as a very well placed uh um uh, but an Indian lady uh, who who actually just wore these beautiful saris and traveling all over the country with her red bindi and everything and uh I mean I haven't seen many people uh doing that I, I sort of personally even now it's only on special occasions that one does it because because of you know what would people think but it's just so amazing how she did that and and, and that kind of that magnet of Srimataji because of who she is drew everyone to her, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Actually, for my first job, I had I wore a sari to to work. This was uh, in nineteen eighty three. Wow, I am and, impressed uh, to hear that. That's <laughs> lovely. Well done, you, Carol. <laughs> but mother, did, mother did realize she did keep on asking me. Um, uh, uh, where are you from? And I'd say Sheffield mother. And I knew in my heart what she wanted me to tell her. It wasn't until I went on the India tour in 82, 83. She, she, she again asked me, in fact, this was about when I went to her feet about, because somebody suggested I should put myself on the wedding list. And um, she said, where, where are you from? <laughs> and I said, mother, I was born in India. She said, ha, I knew, I knew, <laughs> I could see on your face. And it, 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 it's like you're a plant. So it, it, it's, it, it's been a real benefit for me. So I have to say that I'm privileged and lucky for Mother's Grace that I was born in India because it helped to overcome some of this uh, Englishness. Yeah. But instead, you get a bit more colonialist and British, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um... A very, very, um, a very nice to hear that you actually wore um, saris in London because the only thing I can uh, remember is either very elderly uh, Indian ladies wearing it, Asian ladies wearing it, or the white saris of some other um, sort of belief that people that these women used to wear in Oxford, um, which wasn't that appealing at all. But that's great. Do you remember any humorous incidents uh, with Shimatsuji? Because she was always about fun and laughter, isn't there's always that joy um, uh, with this tranquility. I, there, there isn't one word for it, is there? Uh, is there any that you want to share with us? Uh, well, I mean, I come from a family where we don't laugh at all, you know. My father <laughs> was of the opinion one should not laugh, it's not polite, you know. And uh, in fact, he had a friend, his best friend. He did not know how to laugh. You see, this is a very rare thing to find in life, a person who doesn't know how to laugh. If you don't learn how to laugh until the age of five or six, you can never then learn how to laugh later in life, you see. And this poor man, in his youth, there was war in Africa. He was there as a child, you know. He saw such horrible things. He had such a difficult life as a small child. He missed out on learning how to laugh, you see. So uh, he was my father's best friend. And they used to go and see some political comedies, hoping he would somehow learn how to laugh, you know. <laughs> so you can see his best friend couldn't laugh. My father thought laughing is very, it's very rude. One shouldn't do it, you know. So I lived many years under that regime, you know. And then one day I was at mother's house in Brompton Square, I couldn't stop laughing. I started laughing, 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 laughing nonstop. And everybody was looking at me as this guy must be having a possession or a fit, you see. And so I just had to leave mother's room and go outside and wait for all the laughing to stop. It was absolute bliss. I couldn't stop laughing. And then I came back to mother's room and soon afterwards it started again, you know. And this went on for a couple of days. And mother never said a word about it, as if mother knew what was going on. And, you know, so if the laughing, laughing attack came, I'll just get out of the room very fast and so not to disturb so mother can speak. And this went on for three or four days. All the laughing that had been repressed came out, you know. I had never laughed so much in my life. 
And uh, since Sahar's, it's been a, a lot of laughter. <laughs> yes, even with mother, there were small little incidents and small little mistakes, you know, that would make us laugh a lot. I think uh, one that we all laughed a lot is when they arrived at mother's house at Brompton Square, and mother was jumping on the spot, you know. You know, can you imagine mother at the age, you know, and she's jumping up and down, you know, on the stairs, on the floor, is it jumping? Really? Jumping. What in the sitting room? That I don't know if that if that uh, I don't know if that was it's exactly room. unbelievable uh, to imagine Shamatji yeah. doing that. And the two yogis around her started doing the same. So I arrived there and I'm looking at from the door <laughs> uh, before I came. Well, like and jumping on a trampoline. On the yes, mm. like trampoline. And so are the two yogis next to her. And uh, they look at my face. My face must, must have looked terrible, you know, and really astounded. What on earth is this? I've never seen a thing like this, you know. And their faces, mother, they stopped the jumping and they laughed and laughed and laughed. And I couldn't, I, we couldn't stop laughing at this. So what was the situation here? Uh, these two yogis, they were, uh, they've been doing building work and carpentry on mother's floorboards, you know, because there were some creaks, some, you know, the floorboards you walk and they make these noises and, and they had been trying to eliminate all those, uh, all those uh, noises from the floorboards. And they asked mother, mother, do you want to test it, you know? So mother tested it by jumping on some floorboards, some areas that used to be noisy to see, yes, it's fine now, you see. And uh, but let's test the whole room, you know. And then mother said, Luis can come and join up. And so then I joined also in the jumping. So suddenly there was three of us jumping, mother was still jumping a little bit, and we looked at each other. And it was an extraordinary situation. And we just went down laughing, 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 laughing. <laughs> it was something unheard or unseen for me. But th th there would always be something really strange you know it looks strange but you realize it's absolutely normal and natural you know that was yeah they had asked mother to test the floorboard so she jumped you know a few times so did the yogis and so did i in the end but we couldn't stop laughing because brilliant out of the ordinary <laughs> wow um did shumat detail um any sort of treatments to to you both at all yes. Yes, this is related to the William Blake side, in fact. If you, mm -hmm. to me, Sri Mataji told me to worship Sri Mahakali, you know, to pay particular attention to Sri Mahakali. So it means left side problem. And uh, if you listen to, let's say, one of the Sri Mataji's uh, Sri Mahakali puja she gave, in that puja, Sri Mataji explains William Blake, not William Blake, it's Bhairava. She says, Bhairava is the greatest uh, disciple and worshipper of Sri Mahakali. So mm -hmm. the subject of Bhairava and Sri Mahakali are very related. After all, Bhairava, which is the same as William Blake, is the greatest uh, worship, disciple of Sri Mahakali. Mm -hmm. And it's a coincidence that uh, Sri Mataji told to Carol uh, that your only salvation is to worship Sri Mahavira. So this is what Mother said to Carol. So it's very similar because uh, Sri Mahavira, according to Mother, is also Bhairava. So uh, Mother gave us the same advice to work on the Bhairava principle, either Sri Mahakali for me or Mahavira for Carol. And Carol used to ask me, uh, how do I worship Mahavira? You know, uh, our answer was always the same, very simple. You worship Sri Mataji. <laughs> <laughs> what yes. else do, you know? <laughs> because yeah. Mahavira is just one of the aspects of Sri Mataji, isn't it? And Obairava is one of those aspects. In fact, yeah. once Sri Mataji told me that precisely. She said, um, William Blake is in my body. That's what she told me. And then once she said that with her hands, she uh, put the hands on her, let's say, stomach, you know, or void, you know. She didn't. Mm -hmm. She, with both hands she slapped at her said, when she said William Blake it is in my body you now and uh, it's interesting mother went for the void because um, the void is the place of the guru and mother yes. and Sri Mataji has also explained in her talks that uh, William Blake represents the disciple principle so the disciple he has to be with the guru he has to be also in that area of the void so mother is saying he is in my body and she also pointed out that area of the guru, the void, where he is, you know. Uh, after all, he is the disciple. He represents the disciple principle. The Bhairava is, is also the disciple principle. Yes. So the, 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 the disciple has to be with the guru after all. So 
this makes sense. Uh, Amazing. I think I was going to tell a little story. Go on. About, uh, you know, memories of Shimataji. Yes, please. And William Blake, you know, uh, what is what is the relationship between uh, what made us, you know, pay some attention to William Blake? Of course, Mother told us to pay attention to this aspect of Bharava, Makali, or, or Sri or Sri Mahavira. But um, it all started because uh, Shimataji told me to to write to her, you know, write me a letter. So I wrote a, a newsletter giving the news of Portugal, what was happening, you know. And in that newsletter, I went to my Blick books and I cut some paintings out of the books. It was a big sacrifice. So I cut the paintings of Blake and stuck them onto that newsletter. Wrote a little bit about... A handwritten newsletter. A handwritten for... newsletter, yes. It was handwritten. For Sri Mataji, for what, what, what year he's been doing in Portugal. Portugal. And um, because I, I put there two paintings of William Blake, I had to say something about those paintings related to Sahar. So when I met Mother in person, she told me she liked that very much, you know. What wow. uh, little thing I had written about Blake and the paintings of Blake's and she advised me to write about Sahaj Yoga you know and and, she, and then for that reason I felt all right I'm going to write uh, this is how I understood the, um, her advice I'm going to write another newsletter you see by then I had come to live in England and I was living in Liverpool and I wrote another newsletter and sent one to mother this time again I cop from my black books I cut a little uh, painting by Blake, a little engraving, and put it on that newsletter. Put some little thing about Mahavira on the newsletter. And when you met Mother next time, Mother told me again, you know, I liked it very much that I put something about William Blake and Mahavira. I should write more about Sahaja Yoga. Uh, but by then I was uh, doing Mother's transcripts. I was almost every day I was transcribing Mother's talks. <clears throat> and uh, so I told Mother, I'm already doing that because, you know, I'm transcribing your talks, so I'm writing about Sahaj. And I said, that's not what I mean, you know. That's uh, that's important, but that's different. To write about William Blake, uh, to write about Sahaj Yoga is not the same as transcribing my talks, you know. So she reminded me several times, you know, to write about Sahaj Yoga. And I used to tell her, there's nothing I can say about Sahaj Yoga, Mother. You have said everything. It's all in your talks. I actually worship your talks. I transcribe them daily learn from them how can i say something about Sahaja yoga you know and uh, so that was the question and my mother insisted no no write something about Sahaja yoga. you can write more you know i have done that little writing you see um, and i was doing the transcripts i mean i did some uh, little booklets about Sahaj based on transcripts of shimataji shimataji corrected those and sometimes this is interesting mother changed the things she had said on the tapes you know occasionally mother with a red pen crossed out some bits and wrote new things and i said mother they're gonna think i made this up it's not on the tape it's, it's a transcript what will people think you know and i said don't worry put a little note to explain that uh, what mother said on that occasion was not for it was specific individual advice meant for a certain person it was not general advice so all right so that explained why mother crossed that out and then said something else different, which applies much more for, for all of us rather than just for a, a particular person. Mother may give different advice. So we had done this work. And having done that, I thought, at last I've done what mother said. I've written about Saj Yoga. Having just done that, mother tells me, okay, don't forget to write about Saj Yoga. So she reminded me again. I thought, my goodness, I thought I had just done that, you know, but no, that's something different. So much later, at Shubhi comes, again, Mother told me, so, have you started writing about Saj Yoga? I said, no, Mother, I can't. I don't know what to say. I have nothing to say, you know. And I said, all right, write your, write your own testimonial, you know, your experiences in Sahaj. Because I need that for a newspaper in India. Someone, there, was a, there had been a little bit of opposition to Saj Yoga in Maharashtra. And uh, some uh, horrible people threw, threw stones at the Saj Yogas in Maharashtra at one time. And mother wanted to put a few articles out in the Maharashtrian newspapers, you know, with testimonials from the yogis from abroad. So she told me, write your testimonial for it will be. And again, I felt, how can I do that? Mother is such a responsibility. You know, I don't know how to write my testimonial. Can you give me some uh, tips or some um, 
some pointers, some direction, you know, some suggestions, because I don't know what to do. And Srimata, she dictated my testimony. She wrote my own testimony, all of it. I said, Mother, do you mind stopping? I need to get a paper. I need to write this down, you know. I said, no, 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 you can do it. You know, we can write it. It was late in the night already. I said, have a nice sleep, you know, and then next day you can write it. By then I might forget it, you know. So Mother dictated my whole testimonial. She didn't allow me to write it down. The idea is that I should write it the next day. And I, it felt to me like a miracle, you know. I was able to, to write it in the end and to put it in my own words, you know. So Mother was somehow encouraging me to write about Sahaj and I was feeling great uh, lack of confidence. There was another occasion where I received an invitation to go to Sishimataji. Uh, but they didn't tell me the whole invitation, the whole message. The message was for me to write down what mother was going to dictate. That part they didn't tell me. They only told me to go and see Sri Mataji. So I went. It was um, Good Friday. Good Friday, mother was a little bit more serious than usual because this is the day, you know, when Christ was crucified and all that, you know. So it's never an easy day. And the mother was going into meditation, and then she started dictating and dictating. I didn't know what mother was dictating. I was just listening to it. And maybe half an hour later, mother says to me, do you mind reading back the last paragraph? <laughs> That's when I realized I should have been writing it down. Oh, my God. So mother says, so did, didn't they tell you you were coming to, you know, write down what I'm dictating? No, they just told me to come. They didn't say what for. I didn't bring paper or pen, nothing, you see. And mother said, don't worry, it's fine. You can write it down, you know. Just write it down, you know. How am I going to write what mother said? Mother was doing a tremendous speech about Christ, you know. It was all about Christ, mother was explaining. This is Good Friday. And now I have to write this down. <laughs> you know, this is terrible, you know. So we managed to get some paper there at mother's house and the pen, you know. There was another yogi there we arrived. We had arrived just a few minutes ago, you see. And uh, mother went into meditation and uh, the whole thing flew. I was able to write down everything. So I could I could feel how mother was um, helping me to get some confidence that, yes, we can write about such yoga. We can write about these things mother has been teaching us. You know, we have to. She told me to. So um, where, sorry, just uh, curious to know where one could access these testimonials and, and what she told you about uh, Christ on that Good Friday? Yes, I mean, that was sent to uh, that day. The mother then after that dictated a bit more and we wrote a bit more down. By then we had paper at last. And um, she said that in the evening, I was also worried about my English not being good enough. If this is for a newspaper, mother, I wrote some of it because I had to write it from memory. These are my words now, not exactly mother's words, you know. Although it felt like a power, everything came, you know, it felt perfect. The, the, the yogi helped me to correct the, you know, grammar, punctuation, spelling. We tried to do it as good as possible. Yeah. And mother said, don't worry, because Sir CP, he promised to give it a, an overall edit and you know look at it in the evening is going to look at it if there's any mistake you'll fix it on tour so it was done then that letter was sent uh, to the english newspapers in the uk that letter it was a letter mother was dictating for the editors of the newspapers in the uk because mm -hmm. there was a film about christ which was very offensive you know it was mm -hmm. a very, very indecent film about christ where they were suggesting that Christ had an affair with Mary Magdalene. My mother said, this is such an insult, you know. Christ is a man of the highest dharma. He could not have a, an affair with a woman because that's like adultery. It's something very dharmic, you know, in those days, you know. Christ would do, if he wanted to marry, he would marry, but you would not have an affair with a lady, you know. Yeah. And I was explaining this to the editors of the newspapers, so they should not publicize that film. The film was done. On this subject, I think the film was called The Last Temptation. It's not a good film. And mother, no. mother was protesting about that. So it's another occasion, Mother asked me to write down about Saj Yogi. You know, it was like a test, it was an experience for me. And somehow Mother boosted the confidence. And then um, ultimately, at, uh, should, on another occasion at Shudi Camps, after uh, Mother you know, dictated my testimonial, I had to write it the next day. 
uh, I was again worried about the level of English, but mother said, come on, you know, this is going to be translated to Marathi, so don't you worry about the English, it's going to be fine, the such is will uh, translate this. I think I have that document on uh, old, you know, diskette, computer diskette, I think I copied it to an old diskette, but this diskette, oh, nice. they don't go work on these computers anymore, so it may be on that diskette, I hope I kept the copy, which I did much, much later on based on my my notes you know so but i gave it to mother i didn't keep it for myself but i had some handwritten notes of what i wrote and i managed then to type that onto that old diskette and now i cannot uh, access those old formats of <laughs> i think it's there it's not lost technology yeah yes and what my dictated actually went to the newspapers you know as a yes. left to the editors of the uk newspapers but the mother changed it RCP changed it it was corrected it went through many edits before it was sent. Uh, this was, in a way, mother boosting my self-confidence and helping mm -hmm. me write about size yoga. But then at Shudika, she, uh, I was reading a book written by a very a horrible false guru, you know, and he criticized his mother twice in that book. I had underlined that in red. So I showed it to mother, do you know about this false guru, you know? Yes, yes, mother knew about him. And uh, she looked at the book, you know, uh, the book was horrible. And then she told me, you see, you've been asking me, what shall you write about such yoga subject? You know, what you can do is to write about William Blake, because uh, see, this man is a rationalist, is a scientist, and he does not believe in, uh, in faith, in God. He, call, he calls it superstition. And uh, these Marathi people that uh, attack the such yogis with stones, they are disciples of this man whose book you are reading, you see. And since he, William Blake, you know, he really didn't like people like this who were very rational, who didn't have faith in God, didn't believe in any divine revelation, just believed in uh, science and nothing else. And Blake spent his whole life opposing this, this wrong philosophy. So, so you were asking me, what's, what, what's the subject? What can you say about such yoga? I advise you to, to write about William Blake, you know and Sash Yoga, the, the two together. So that's how it started. It took many years of mother encouraging us and supporting us and teaching us how to do. And she, yes. talked, to me, she talked to me a right. lot about William Blake. So right from your first interest back in Portugal when you were a student, your interest in William Blake when you um, thanked Mr. Blake uh, for giving you the opportunity to translate Shimatsuji's talks when she visited Portugal and addressed the seekers and the Sahajogis there. So that that was your uh, in, sort of initial um, journey with Blake. What inspired you to work on the glimpses of Sahaja Yoga in the paintings of William Blake? Because there's a lot of uh, motifs, lots of... Um, similarities if i can put it simplistically uh in in the way uh william blake has portrayed uh sahaja yoga and sahaja yogis to be what was the inspiration for you i'm gonna hand over this to carol because yeah carol yeah i addressed this question to both of you both. so you decide who's talking carol spent also a long time working on this subject yes with, with us but this came from a a lecture Shrimataji gave us about William Blake at her house. I'm going to ask her to tell this part of the story. Okay. <laughs> uh, to be a bit more in the center, if you want. No, I'm okay. Um, yes, it was at the time uh, still uh, when um, Louis was going to Brompton Square to help with the work there, and he did some um, gold uh, gilding there as well. And um, they quite often had a rest during the periods of um, work where they would, mother might ask them into her room and, and uh, everybody would be delighted that mother was going to talk to them. Uh, Louis and uh, a French Saj Yogi were already there waiting mm -hmm. and um, because they'd been doing some quite clean work, whereas uh, the, some other people needed to clean up a bit before they came. And yes. they saw, saw on the coffee table a book well, the French Sai Yogi saw this book. He said, oh, uh, Shumataji, this, this book is William Blake. Um, can I have a look at it, please? 
And mother said, what a good idea, what a good idea, but let's wait for everybody else to come and then we can all enjoy it. And so, um, of course, Luis was interested because he already interested in yeah. Um And when everybody else arrived, there was a group of science yogis who was working, mother started, put, picked up the book and started looking through the pages. And at first they were just seeing mother's face as she was looking at the pictures of Blake and looking really closely and like, doing like this and going wah, wah, wah. And, was so herself was just so enjoying seeing the pictures and then finally she started um turning the pictures around and showing them what they were and sort of saying um you can see here look these are the three channels look at this picture see there's here they've got the hand on Sasrara. mother started pointing out these motifs and Luis, i think you can take it from here no you know just <laughs> back to the front. Please, please remind us the year well what what year was it i mean I'm reminded, uh, Shankar, J and I, we, we stood outside Brompton Square House. It's, of course, no longer in any Sergio Yogi's um, sort of realm of affairs, but the vibrations are still so beautifully yes. uh, strong there. Um, so which year are we talking about? And please continue. <laughs> 84, I think, yes. Yeah, I believe it's 84 when she gave that. It was a master lecture, Mother gave about an hour and a half, you know. I don't know if I already covered this. No, not how long it was, or just that when Mother started turning around the yes. pictures and showing well, them to the things. And all you, all you well, we had to wait about well. 20 minutes for all the, that, yes, yeah. for the other yogis to arrive. And so it was a very long session. Mother explained so many things, you know. And then one day, this is much later on, she, Mata, she was no longer talking that much. She was... Uh, uh, it's a phase in life, Mother. I went into meditation and was no longer talking that much to to the yogis or, or, or giving public lectures or even pushes. She was not talking that much. This is the 2005, six onwards, isn't yes, it? Exactly. Around that time, 2005, the message came, you see. Uh, Shimataji was, uh, there was this uh, recollection books, you know, about UK. Yes. Was, it was being done per country by country. So, the first draft of, about the recollections of the UK, recollections of mother's uh, mother's things, you know, mother's memories. And mother, this was being read to mother by her family and by the yogis who were living there with mother. They were reading the first draft to mother. They were not sure if mother was paying attention or not, or if she was really deep in meditation, not quite listening, you know, or half listening, half in meditation. They didn't know. By the time they read the whole draft to the end, you know, it's a big book, you know. Uh, Sri Mataji said the names of the yogis who had not given testimonials, you know. So mother was not, uh, yes, she was in meditation, but she could do so many things at the same time. Although she was not talking much, she gave you a huge list of names of people who didn't give them their memories, did not contribute. And then she said something even more extraordinary. What about the things I've been saying about William Blake to individual such yogis? You know, I was one of those culprits. I had not yet shared everything Mother told me about William Blake, you know, because she said so many things and some are hard to explain, takes a long time to write. And uh, the message came, look, Shamata, she, what Mother is talking. Yes, she said, <laughs> we have to share those things she said about William Blake also. Oh, I see. Well, that's a difficult one. I had already shared a few, but not all. And this this one particular one about the glimpses of Sahaja or the motifs of Sahaja Yoga in William Blake's paintings, we had not shared that yet. So that's when uh, me and Carlos started working on it, started doing the research. We felt the easiest way would be to do um, a slideshow. In those days, there were these yeah. slideshows projected onto a wall. So we did that at Shalsham Road and... Uh, so this is what came out of that great great lesson mother gave about with the book of William Blake explaining to all of us the motifs. We decided to share that lesson by finding some examples of those things that mother was saying, the things mother was explaining on that occasion. Carol worked on it from day one with me. She wrote and rewrote everything, you know. That's why I handed over to her. <laughs> she <laughs> not, she I, <laughs> the bit was a bit about mother showing all the um, motifs, you know, the bandans and every pic, every painting. Mother said that showed several um, motifs 
of Sahaja Yoga. And it really is like Mother says, uh, William Blake writes all about Sahaja Yoga. He also, his paintings are all about Sahaja Yoga. And what we found out when we started doing the glimpses was really that you could feel, really feel the effect that Blake's paintings had on oneself when you were working with them for some time. And even when um, we showed the, the glimpses at Flood Street one time, because um, it's gone through various different stages of, of technology, let's say, <laughs> till it's come back to the exhibition. I mean, it's all been worked on for quite quite some years and for a long time. Um, but there's people who come and say a one particular picture, it just really speaks to me, you know, this, it really did something to me, it really worked on a particular chakra, it solved a particular problem. And um, and Mother spoken about how William Blake really did such a great job for her in this yes. country, in this country. Yes. Yes, um, I think it will kind of become increasingly more acceptable with time. Even now, uh, it seems like few compared to the population that we have realize that connection, isn't it? Um, but yes, in time to come, certainly. Did you ever visit Tate uh, to see Blake's painting? Oh, which yeah. I did. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> because we had a, 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 it was about 1984 and we were living in Shelton Road and uh, I had a, a, our small baby. So Lewis used to go to Brompton Square and come back with these things. So the beginning of the story is Lewis, where he went with mother and other such yogis. Yes, we, we were at Sachin Brut and the message came, Mad is going to go to the Tate Gallery now to see William Blake's paintings. Those who are free, we want to go, let's go. I said straight away, Carol, we're going to be late, there's no time, because the message reached very late, just a few minutes before Mad was meant to be there. And, you know, it takes so long to put the baby in a pusher and dress him and spare clothes and the bottles and spare bottles and the whole thing. And Carol was not, Carol was not dressed. She was still in her pajamas, you know. And I said, you know, I'm going to go alone, you know, and I'll tell you all about it. You know, I'll tell you everything Mother says when I return and next week I'll take you there, you know. And we did that, you see, so... We went there and mother didn't speak that much because the place was so full of people but mother did something else even more interesting to each and every painting of william blake because mother could not do a speech or explain she put the hands towards the paintings of william blake she raised them like this you know towards the painting and she she said tremendous vibrations tremendous vibrations can you feel the vibrations of these paintings so there was one such yogi not many such yogis managed to be there on time when mother came. So there was just a few of us, three or four. And so one of us next to mother on each side, we were also checking the vibrations, same time as mother, you know. And the vibrations was just like a bath or a cold bath of cool vibrations from each and every painting. And uh, so the thing mother said the most on that occasion, she couldn't talk in the middle of the exhibition because she was so busy with people, was, Tremendous vibrations, amazing vibrations. This is terrific. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? And yes, wow. we all felt it, you know, the Sajogi is there with her, two or three, maybe four of us. It was incredible. We have, we have never, never had a, an experience so strong of feeling vibrations from like this, you know. But yeah. mother, I, we didn't know if Mother is actually vibrating the paintings herself for everybody or it's true. They have those vibrations. Mother can feel this. Yes. Usually, usually we would not be able to feel these things, but being next to mother, we could feel the same as mother, or at least yeah. we, thought, we thought we could feel it, you know. It was extraordinary. It was tremendous vibrations. Exactly what mother was saying, tremendous vibrations. You know, yeah. terrific, extraordinary. Mother had an incredible vocabulary, you know, of saying great yeah. words about those paintings, you know. And... Um, by the end of Were the you day, taking notes when, uh, because there was very limited things that Shumatji said because there was a lot of people? Yes, but the, at the end, you know. You took notes? No, we never <laughs> took notes. Everything was in the head, you know. This, yes. this <laughs> the head had to remember some <laughs> things. We only remember 10% of the things Mother says, but still, I didn't never wrote it down. 
at the end of the exhibition, there was a, a glass cabinet and the, inside that cabinet at the bottom, there were very tiny engravings of William Blake in black and white. About this big. About this big, you know, so oh. tiny. And to see them is impossible inside the glass cabinet. And mother was putting the head virtually, you know, there on top of the glass cabinet to see those engravings that were almost a meter down, you know. Wow. And uh, she was saying these are amazing, tremendous vibrations, you know. We were not so impressed. We could hardly see it, live alone, understand it. <laughs> mother said, tremendous vibrations. Can you check this? And we checked and we were... Wow, that is incredible. How can mother even see this, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can feel the vibrations when you said how she said tremendous vibrations. They're so cool. It's just, yeah, amazing. <laughs> so this was a puzzling situation, you know. Uh, these, these little engravings mother was praising so much. They were incredible, they were tremendous, they were terrific. Mother has a, an ending vocabulary. Yeah. They're, called, they're called the Virgil, William Blake's Virgil illustrations. Later on, we looked into some Blake books, and at last we found a book that tells us the poem, you know, the text of the poem that Blake is illustrating. It's not actually the actual words from Virgil. It's There's another English poet that translated that from Latin into English, and this is the text that Blake is illustrating. And... Uh -huh. um, when you look at that story that Blake is illustrating, you realize it is indeed about such yoga, you know. It's about uh, a guru-disciple relationship, how the guru removes all the problems of the disciple. And this was a disciple suffering from left-side problems. Yeah. He, he was suffering from left-side problems, and the guru has to arrive and remove all his problems until he's in such state of joy that he starts writing poetry in praise of the divine, like Bajan's. So in the end, this disciple starts, it erupts into song, into bhajans, you know. That's how it, it ends. So this is clearly a story very relevant to Sahaj. And Mother is such an expert in William Blake because other scholars have pointed out that this was Blake's most influential work in his lifetime. Because other artists who knew Blake, very young artists, they called themselves the ancient, the ancients. But there were a group of young people who followed Blake and admired him as a great uh, painter and creator and artist. And you could see that the art was influenced by those uh, little tiny uh, Virgil engravings that Blake did, you know. So Mother is such a connoisseur. She knew this is some of the very influential work that Blake did that influenced the art of, of that time. So lots of uh, painters adopted that style of William Blake from us. Uh, yeah. So um, could you tell us something about uh, the, you know, there's this famous mask of Blake. Some people say it's the life mask, which is what we'd like, we believe. Some said, say, it's the death mask of Blake at the National Portrait Gallery. And um, did you ever get to um, present to Shimatsuji, yes. discuss with her? All this, um, Carol's, Carol's present throughout <laughs> the whole event, you know, you better tell Go on then. It's your time, Carol. You were there. <laughs> I think you were living in Wales at this time, I think, isn't it? Yes. Wales. Wales. Uh-huh. We're living in Wales, but we would come every opportunity we could back to London if something was happening uh, with strategy and yeah. obviously. Um, Mother sent us there because... Um, so that Lewis could um, study at that university to do a, a master's law degree in, in, in international law of the sea. Uh, international law of at the law, law of the sea, marine law. law of the sea, marine law. Okay, which university is this then? Um, it's the University of, of, of Wales. It's in Cardiff. It's in Cardiff. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. Um, so CP is now a chancellor of that or um, an honorary professor. professor there because, and um, of course, yes, because it, there's a long story about that, but it's not yes. now, maybe. <laughs> I can tell that story because mother told me to talk about Sir CP, you know, to the professor of law, which was a, he was an expert in international law, but so is Sir CP. So yeah. is actually the top expert in international law. And Shimata, really? you told me to talk about CCP during my interview. And marine law, he said. And marine law, yes. So uh, when mother sent me there to Cardiff, uh, you know, to study that marine law, it's because 
I could not do my military service because I was a heart patient, you know. Uh -huh. And mother felt it's very dangerous for me to do this uh, um, military military service now in Portugal because I'm a heart patient, you know, dangerous, you know. In fact, a brother of mine had a heart attack during his military service. I was uh -huh. also a heart patient. So it was not a good idea. But one way to avoid the military service is to do a, to join a university. You can postpone the military service that way. Meanwhile, I was applying for British citizenship. So as soon as my passport comes through, that takes a year, a year and a half, in fact, it took. Then I can show that to the military that I've changed nationality and they don't want me there in the military then. So that was to buy some time. So mother sent me there. But she kept telling me, you know, uh, at the interview, when I speak to the, at the interview, make sure you mention CRCP several times. And I did. And during that interview, the the professor decided, well, I also want to meet CRCP because this is the, the man I admire the most. There's no greater expert in, in international law of the, of the sea than CRCP. Wow. And uh, you are yes. going to be my student and you met him so many times and I've never even met him. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invite him to be a, a professor or Norris cause of this university. And that actually wow. happened, they did, you know, and mother came and says, CP, this is a very long story. And uh, <laughs> the mother visited Cardiff uh, at this University of Wales campus. Yes, she came and she brought her. Uh, she came with her CP. Uh, mother, she oh, well. also came. It was an important occasion. Yeah. And uh, then she so this is 84, sorry. Um, Interject 84 is this 1984 no, 85 86 86 maybe 86, 86 maybe I can't remember that theory when can you believe 85 86 86 by then and uh, so she matter she went to the university with CCP there was a very special occasion in, in, in his honor to make him a, a professor of uh, honoris cause of that university and uh I was also studying there. I was studying there, and she asked my professor, you know, how did I do in my exams, you know? So when I met Shimataji at the airport, she tells me, congratulations, you did very well on your exams. And I said, uh, this could be a misunderstanding, mother, because my exams are not yet out, you know? They're they are gonna be published next week, so nobody knows my results yet. If anyone told you, <laughs> it's probably a misunderstanding. I didn't know mother had spoken to my professor. And mother said, there's no misunderstanding. I spoke to your professor, you see. <laughs> you, did, you came up top, you know, in three subjects out of four, you know. Wow. So mother was, uh, your professor is very pleased with your performance because you got top mark in three subjects out of four, you know. And mother knew my results before I knew by talking to my professor, you know. I couldn't even <laughs> believe it. I thought someone must have given wrong information to mother about yeah. me passing because I don't officially the results were not yet out. So this was the Maya. Mother knows everything that's happening in your life. She knew my results yeah. before I knew them, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. She, uh, you know, every mother was kind of knew the future. You could see how well mother knows the future. Absolutely, since, yeah. In the end, uh, you know, I managed to postpone my military service. Then my British passport arrived just on time, and I managed to avoid doing the military service, which for me was a danger because I was a heart patient. Yes. And then the mask. Uh, yeah. Oh, the mask. Yes. The mask was. Um, it was during this period, and probably just before the story Louis has just told, because it was whilst we were at Wales. Um, Louis was still studying you and he was going to do a, uh, the second year and then take his exams we were in between and we thought well it would be good to see mother what maybe we can do something and give her something and we 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 were already um reading about Blake and Louis was already interested in Blake and we had found out that um well, no, we hadn't. We went. We went to the National Portrait Gallery to see the Blake's portrait, and mm -hmm. at that time, in front of Blake's portrait, they used to display the a bronze of Blake's head. Um, and in the in the shop, in the gallery shop, they had um, plaster plaster copies of this um, head of Blake. And at that time, it was painted black. 
because they all actually had exhibited it in a shop as the death mask of William Blake. Yeah. Which later on we had we found out that it's not a death mask at all. Um, even most of the Blake scholars know that it's the uh, life mask, in fact. But the point was we we bought one of these to show to, to give to mother, but we weren't sure whether she would like it or not, because at the time we thought it's a death mask. You never know what. Yes. To do. So there was this big event where um, Amjad Ali Khan was uh, playing at um, I think the Commonwealth Institute in London um, that evening and um, mother was going to go be there and she was going to be there with quite a lot of important diplomatic people and um, her family. So a lot of the Saj yogis were going. We had the, the box with us with the mask inside it and um, but at the interval, we thought mm, now's our chance, but it was a little difficult because Lewis had the box in his hand and he thought it'd just bring up the the um just start taking <laughs> taking the mask out of the box a bit. I mean, it's not really a, a mask as such, it's a whole head sculpture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was when from quite a long distance away, mother suddenly, although she was talking to these dignitaries she was amazing she turned around and she said look he's in meditation look he's meditating this is something like this Lewis yeah she said uh, as I remember uh, I took the lid out of the box you know and was pre preparing myself to take the whole head out of the box but as soon as I took the lid she might as she turned around although she was talking to those dignitaries and she pointed at the statue Although all you could see was the sastra of William Blake, nothing more. The box, the head was still inside the box. I didn't have time to take the box, the the head out of the box, just the lid. But from that distance, mother pointed this and she said, "Is he not beautiful? Isn't he beautiful? Isn't he beautiful? He is in meditation." Just from seeing the top of the head, mother is telling us he is in meditation. Mm -hmm. Isn't he beautiful? You know. And, and she was she was quite a distance away from you. About two, two meters, maybe. Yeah, okay. Two, three meters she was talking to those people. As soon as the yeah. lid comes out, mother turns around and she sees the top of the box, the head, and from just from the sastra of the William Blake, she knows who it is, what it is, everything. And she answered that question. You see, he was not uh, dead. In fact, when you see the whole, the scholars have researched this, this uh, incident. What happened, William Blake, according to them, he fell asleep during the, the taking of the mask, you know, somehow William Blake fell asleep during the process. Deep in meditation. Yeah, mother is correcting it. So he did not fall asleep. He's actually in meditation. So now we, mother added a little extra to the meaning of, of this incident. It's, he's not dead. It's, it's, a, it's a live mask. He's not even asleep. He's in meditation. So mother added a little extra knowledge to this uh, incident. Was it anything to do with the color of the mask at uh, Shadikan? Yes. yes, I mean, then we asked mother later, uh, when mother was going to the car, we asked mother, mother, do you like that uh, thing? You know, I said, yes, yes, it's all right. So we, we gave it to the to the driver, to, yes, so it went in mother's car, you know, with the flowers and a few things people give to mother sometimes, you know, anything, a letter. So that box went into mother's car. But I asked mother, first asked, mother, do you like the statue? You know, because we wanted to make sure she likes it, otherwise you don't give it to her. And she said, yes, yes, it's fine, you know. And so later, at Shudi Camps, you know, that's a, maybe two years later, uh, mother's, uh, you know, uh, that box appears again. I knew straight away what, what, what this box is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the box appears because we were packing mother's stuff and putting them in boxes and organizing things. And mother looks at me and I look at her and mother continues the conversation from two years back, you know, which was, yes, you asked me whether, whether I like it. Mother was like this. She could continue a conversation two days later. This happened several times. She knew exactly where we were. So you were asking me whether I like this. Uh, to tell you the truth, I do like it. But uh, I wish it, they did not make it black, you see. It could have been a you know a lighter color, not so dark, not so black, you know. Yeah. And so great. So now mother continued that conversation, you see. So we went back to the museum again, to the National Portrait Museum. And again we thought, oh my goodness, 
this is a, a surprise. They started doing them in uh, natural skin tones, not black anymore. <laughs> After mother said that, you know, some oh, yeah. have the inspiration. Let's change this. Why are we painting this black? It's not a death mask, you know. <laughs> should be painted you know in more or less natural tones or plaster because it's made of plaster after all so they started doing them in a natural skin tone not dark black you know yeah. so it was a change you know it seemed a miracle to us as if someone can hear what mud is saying the artists got okay. they, they hear it somehow in the unconscious they, these messages of mother they go everywhere mm -hmm. That is so amazing. And I believe you still probably have another of those masks somewhere. I don't own a copy. <laughs> Magic vibrations? No. I think why? Because they stopped selling them in plaster. They started selling them in a kind of acrylic uh, plastic ah. material, you know. We wanted to have one like the one that we showed to mother made of plaster. Yes. But right now they're making them in a, a, it's unbreakable now. It's a kind of a plastic material. I don't know what the name of that is. Not, not very natural, probably. I, I don't like that. The ones that they are giving, selling there now. I'm waiting to get one made of natural products like plaster. Hopefully, sure. hopefully not painted black, but let's see. If I <laughs> yes, can. hopefully painted in skin tone. <laughs> 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 um, and I think just before uh, we went to uh, India to teach at Shamanji School in Dharamshala, um, Shankarji was just showing me some places in uh, London, and one of it was at uh, Bunhill Cemetery and uh, William Blake's uh, place, which was absolutely powerful uh, with vibrations, and someone had put flowers on there, but it was just so perplexing for me personally to see that people were just walking walking carelessly almost you know because it's part of the path it's part of a park and people were having their tea break and stuff like that which was nice it's a bit further down but it was just amazing how you know such a great uh, personality was just there uh, and yet the world was just walking by almost ignorant of it. Um, so how did you two actually find the location of the grave uh, of William Blake, uh, potentially using the vibrations? But could you tell us the details of it and how you went about, uh, you know, proving it to the city of London uh, and the Blake scholars, if you could, please? Yes. I'm going to hand over this one to Carol also, because I, I do most of the talking <laughs> usually. <laughs> but uh, better at it. <laughs> I'll say I'm going to ask Carol to read something Mother said about the grave of William Blake. See, the idea of marking the grave of William Blake is not uh, an original idea of ours. Mm. I heard Mother saying this in her talk several times, you know. Mm. And... I also had heard, and Carol too, that Mother had advised some English as yogis, some of the early yogis, to go there and pay, pay our respects to the grave of William Blake, you know. So we knew all that. Uh, we have here the quote of Mother some, in one talk, you know. There's more than one talk where Mother says these things, you know. Yes. But I could, I could only find one talk where, a transcript, you know, on, on Amruta. There it is. At last we found one talk where Mother talks about the grave of William Blake. She went there herself to see it, you know. I'm going to ask yeah. her, can you read what Mother said mm -hmm. about the grave of William Blake? Mother even, sure. gave, she mother, she even gave the postcode of the of the graveyard for the Sajogis to go there, you see. So this is how... Wow! I'm... Is this in shitty camps? No, Mother said it's in a public program in UK at wow. the Hampstead... Uh, this is yeah, friends eating house at Hampstead. Hampstead. That's where mother gave it. this transcript comes from that talk. Wow. So this is a public program. And mother is even giving the postcode of the of the cemetery for people to go and visit. So and she's complaining that this is not done properly. It needs to be respected, that grave. So wow. I mean, do you mind if Carol reads the, the words yes, mother said, what mother said about the grave? Well, it's it's interesting actually because. Very early on, I think even before I uh, met Lewis and we were married, that we were con I was conscious and Lewis had also had the same experience, conscious that mother was talking about Blake's grave and how awful it was that it wasn't marked. So we both knew this for quite a long time. 
um, it was in the sort of Sahaj. Uh, grapevine, yes. Yes, yes. grapevine. And um, I, from the first, I sort of thought this is terrible. It, we should be doing something. We should be doing something, but you know, anyway. So um, this is what mother had said. Uh, and as Lou said, we found this ex extract, which is in 22nd of November, 1984 from a talk where we have to be very honest people. Um, mother said, England has to become Jerusalem as promised by William Blake. But how many have any regard for William Blake? I was amazed. I wanted to find his burial place where he was buried and what was the tomb they erected for him. And in a forlorn place in EC1, in a most neglected place, he is laid down there, just neglected. It's so sad. He thought of England to be Jerusalem one day. The holiest of holy is laid down there, neglected, and everybody walking on his tomb. Nobody is respecting him. That's what England is today. But if William Blake had died in India, I can tell you this much. There would have been thousands sitting there. Take it from me. Even today in India, a saint is respected much more than a king and the queen, much more. Thousands would be there. Wow. Yeah. So it took a long time before we even visited Bunhill Fields. Um, and it was always conscious that we hadn't visited for Lewis, it was a scary thing because the cemetery is a cemetery. <laughs> yes, Be before coming to Sahas, uh, I used to have um, suffer from fear of ghosts, you know. I mean, Shimataji cured that disease in about, uh, I don't know, two to three weeks, I was cured of this disease. But this is a phobia, which is very serious, you know. Fear of ghosts during the night doesn't let you sleep in with fear. So my instinct was telling me, I know Mother said we should visit his grave, but you know, just in case I get these fears coming back, you know, I've been cured, you know, after three weeks in Sahaj, but, you know, let's play safe. I also don't watch these, uh, some horror films, you know, on TV, you know, about ghosts and things. I don't watch those things. Just to be on the safe side, I don't want any of that to come back to me. Yeah. In fact, I heard some uh, certain Sajogini who also used to have this type of fears, and by looking at paintings of Blake, she got cured of that as well. It was a wow. experience she had also. Amazing, yeah. So it helps the, this fear of the subconscious or the left side problems. So that, that is why we delayed going to the cemetery to see Blake's grave. <laughs> but in the end, there was a little miracle. Carol got a job uh, next door to where Blake is, is buried. And uh, <laughs> And there was some little work on, in the kitchen. So the boss told them, go and take, eat your sandwiches there on the park where William Blake is buried. So they were told to go and have their lunch, you know, at the grave of William Blake, so to say. So Carol <laughs> was the first of us, the two of us, to go to the grave of William Blake. After that, I felt... So you were wearing your saris, Carol, to work <laughs> and back. <laughs> no, in fact, it's not. But... <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, mm. Go on, sorry. You do, you do, you know this. <laughs> well, at first I, I didn't want to tell Louis that's what I've been doing because I knew he wouldn't think it was the right thing to be eating my sandwiches <laughs> in the cemetery. But when I told him actually, uh, when you get there for the first time, the, you know, there's that stone which is near to a big monument, big yeah. obelisk for Daniel Defoe, also, you know, a great mm -hmm. fighter. Yes. And it says nearby lie, William Blake and uh, his um, his wife Catherine Sophia Blake. And you just think, where is that nearby? Because there's nothing to show where it is. It was so disappointing. So I told this to Lewis when I came um, home, and and uh, he he said, well, next weekend let's let's go and we'll go and see it together. So um, that was really the beginning of the whole searching for the Blake's grave and this feeling that maybe we could find out where it really was. On vibrations. Uh, I would imagine from Shimataji's public uh, program talk in 1984, this is, we are talking about the summer of 1985, when, when you first visited uh, Bunhill together, was it? 
or is it 84 itself? Uh, no, it was actually, um, I had got this, because we hadn't been living in London um, some of this uh, time between 84 and then mother sort of sent us away from London. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was actually, I got the job, it was nine, 1998, it was in the 1998 or 1999 um, that we finally did go because you know, life takes over things, but I, I oh. and yeah, it wasn't till then that we 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 went. Yes. So, what was the experience like? Uh, when we arrived there, uh, we saw that nearby, and what came to mind is a great miracle from Mother in Portugal. Sri Mataji discovered the Swainbu on vibrations, you know, from a long, long distance, even as the yeah. car. Mad was going to a particular place, you know, and uh, while she was being driven, she kept saying, the vibrations are wrong, this is too good, this is too strong, you know, what have you got here, you know, and we said, the mother, this is, um, this is the poorest part of Lisbon, this is not the best part, you know, this is, there's lots of, um, what do you call this, shanty towns here and everything, you know, we don't think there's anything great here, you know. I said, no, there must be something important. The vibrations are too strong, you know. And mother asked two questions. And those questions mother asked are very important for this discovery of Blake's grave for us. She asked this question. Do you happen to have a, a tooth of Lord Buddha here in a temple or in a church? And said, uh, we never heard of something like that. I think we would have heard if there was a tooth of Lord Buddha here. Wow. And mother said, uh, wait, do you happen to have some hairs from the Prophet Muhammad here somewhere? Not that we know of, but, you know, I think we would have heard if that was the case, you know, because something so important like that, you know. And mother said, uh, mother kept saying, my breasts are very strong. Then she said, I think it's a swayambu, mother said. You know, I think it's a swayambu. So, but she had asked those two questions. Is it the tooth of Lord Buddha? Is it some hairs of the Prophet Muhammad that are causing these strong vibrations? Then mother decided it's actually a swayambu. And from a long distance, mother saw a little statue of the Virgin Mary that was being carried on a palanquin, you know, it was a procession. And she said, there's your swayambu. From a long distance, mother knew. People may not believe, how, how, how can mother know those things? But she said, go and ask there in the church and they'll tell you the story of that statue. And so it was, the, they had even a booklet printed about the story of that statue. That statue was miraculous. Lots of people got cured. Uh, they built a church in honor of that little statue because so many people got uh, cured from that statue. So they knew it's a miraculous statue. And that statue came out of the earth, you see. Now that's what they wrote on the story. It was inside a little grotto. You know, and they had. Is to... it linked in any way? There was this um, miracle story that came up in in just the media uh, in those in that time, and I remember reading it somewhere. How um, Virgin Mary appeared uh, to the three children in Portugal, three young. Yes, it is children. related. It's, it's part of the same tradition. You see, so that was the miracle in Fatima in 19, 19, 1999, 1919 around that time but this statue appeared in, in 1822 you know that's that's a very ancient story so we yeah. have never heard of that mother knows everything you know we are living there all our lives this happened in 1822 the apparition of this statue yes and uh, that statue is still there being worshipped and they do a little procession to that statue once per year but mother saw the whole thing from a distance, long, long distance, and on, on vibrations she knew this is a swayambu. And uh, when we arrived at Blake's grave and we saw, oh, nearby, we thought, that was an inspiration. Mother can feel the vibrations from kilometers away, you know. And then from a long, long distance, there's a statue that is about, uh, I don't know, 10 centimeters high from a long distance inside the car. Mother knows this is the swayambu. How can she do this thing? She's extraordinary. But oh. then we also thought, this is now the rational process. If, if Mad is saying that even a tooth of Lord Buddha or even some hairs of the Prophet Muhammad, they can give such strong vibrations. Yeah. 
I can feel from a long, long distance, you know, we have all the teeth of William Blake here. We have all his hairs. We have all his, we have all his bones even. We have his whole body buried here. <laughs> if some very ordinary yogis like me and Carol, and it's nearby, it's not a big distance, we might be able to, to feel this on vibrations, you see. Yeah. That's the inspiration to, for us to feel confident. Okay, let's see if we can do that. Absolutely. And it happened because uh, we were in the open, open air. So any breeze that you feel on your hands or cool breeze in the open air, the doubts will be that this is the wind, this is the breeze, you know. That's different, isn't it? Yeah. Vibrations, you see. So Mother gave us a, a very strong uh, experience. It was not just like a little cool breeze. We felt yeah. this was hot in the summer. We felt as if someone had dropped a bucket of cold water over our heads, you know, bang, a full <laughs> bath. That's a, that's a type of vibrations we felt, not just a little cool breeze. No, and, no uh, doubt. And then there was something else we also felt what Carol, and I will tell the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, a fragrance, you know, a wonderful fragrance, which was just around that spot where we were feeling the coolness as well. And, um, uh, for me, I just felt it smelled a bit like a, a, a little yellow flower which grows on a tree in, in India. And I was used to that, the smell of that plant or that tree. Um, Jasmine, so, probably. Yeah, maybe. I, I, something like a um, mimosa or something, some kind yes. of. Yes. Uh, and um, so Louis, coming from Catholic background, knows that quite often when there's a saint buried somewhere, they, they do smell a fragrance of of roses or a fragrance of flowers. So this was amazing for us. And we just sort of, with my scientific hat on, I go, well, you know, we better check there isn't an actual plant. We're just giving off this smell. So we must go around and look everywhere to see if we smell it anywhere else. And uh, yeah. so we did walk around. We didn't feel the cool, like, you know, this sort of bucket of water as Louis describes it. And, um, the fragrance wasn't anywhere else. We came round and back again. And uh, we even came back another weekend to make sure that, you know, the same place was still as felt the same to us. And and uh, that's really where it all started, wasn't it? Yes. So but mother how did... You know, yeah. Was, because what she said but in the talks... Mother's I, miracles all the way through. All yes, the way through. mother's she gave always... Us the... Everything, wasn't it, really? Yeah, Beautiful. Miss... Mother. she we heard mother say that on her talks more than once i only found on amruta one extract confirming that but mother said it on other occasions about the importance of the grave of william blake you know and what she did in portugal was tremendous inspiration to be able to feel things from yes. such a great distance that was the foundation wasn't it yes. and uh, so we felt on our since we have all the teeth and all the bones and all the hairs we might be able to feel it, who knows, let's try, you know, and it Which is great, as our yogis, you know, we, we have this uh, gift from Shramataji, we can feel it on the vibrations on our subtle system in terms of fragrance as Sri Sagan, the Lakshmi and all those uh, blessings we have. But how do you, how did you do your research to prove it to, to those who don't have this uh, extra... Again. Uh, the, the research, I would say, mother did that too. Mm. You see, the research, mother put it in our laps. You know, it all came to us. It was an actual miracle. Mm. Uh, Carol is very scientific, and we felt we need to visit the grave another time, as she, as she said, and see if we can feel the vibrations again and the fragrance. You know, is it a one off? You know, otherwise, you know. So next week we went back there again and uh, let's see if we can feel it again and in the same spot and if you feel it elsewhere, it's a failure. It, 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 <laughs> not, it does not prove anything. So we were standing there, we checked the vibrations again and we went back to the same spot and there we are with our hands out, enjoying the vibrations with our eyes closed, both of us, you know, and lost in this joy, the, the fragrance, everything was, the, the experience repeated itself. We knew for a fact that Blake is buried here, no doubt whatsoever. And then suddenly a guy taps me on my shoulder from behind and he says, what on earth are you doing here standing over the grave of William Blake? This is like a, a frightening thing. So what, who is this guy now? I, I went, I walked backwards one meter, you know, I cannot stand over the grave of William Blake. This guy is talking like mother now. 
And how does he know? So I asked him, how do you know? And they asked me the same question, how do you know? <laughs> so we have to compare <laughs> stories, you see. Well, we know because on vibrations, you know, we had this experience. And so now, how do you know? I asked him, you know. I know because there was an old man who used to come here and sit in this bench here next to the stop or the, the spot where you are standing. There's a, 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 there's a bench there. And this old man used to sit on that bench. And uh, this guy was the caretaker of the cemetery. And he asked, the, he asked the old man, why do you always sit in this bench and nowhere else, you know? And the old man said, because this is the bench that is the nearest one to the grave of William Blake. Now, this caretaker had an art degree, and he was crazy about William Blake. William Blake was his passion, you know. Can you imagine you meet there a man who's supposed to be the caretaker and the gardener, but he has an art degree, is the... His, his greatest poet and, and painter is William Amazing, Blake. Isn't it? Yeah. And the old man told him the location of Blake's grave. He said this is also part of his mission in life to, to, to prove it that this is the place. Like the old man said, how does the old man know? The old man knows because uh, this man used to be in charge of that graveyard many years ago when he was young. And he was he was the one who took the the stone of William Blake from the location of the grave to where to that location there next to Defoe's uh, obelisk. Oh. This is the old man who took the stone from the correct location and put it there because uh, that was the plan. There was a very landscape. It was being landscaped at that time, so it has to, had to be taken out. He's the man who did it. He knew the location and he told that. So this guy, who, this caretaker we met there, his name is Robin, he told us, you know, I have here a book about uh, this cemetery, a very, very big book, you know, and lots, lots of maps, you know. And so he gave us the book, take the book home, you do the research. After all, you are a lawyer, you are used to doing, you know, research in libraries and books. Your wife is a landscape architect, you know, you seem to be- Yes, perfect. For, uh, marking it on the ground and measuring it and doing the calculations. So here is the book about the cemetery. Here are the maps. Go to that place, the Guildhall, the Guildhall Library, and they have more records there. So th everything was falling on all up. When we arrived at um, Guildhall Library, remember we asked to see the papers to do with William Blake, and by mistake they brought they brought us the wrong box. But inside that box there was one document. That box was something else. But inside that box, there was one vital document about the, the grave of William Blake explaining, you know, how to do the, the calculations was buried before Blake and after Blake in that spot. The whole thing was there. And then yeah. I was surprised. I brought you the wrong box called the Noble Collection box, which is not about William Blake. And there it is, you know. And we said, well, we are used to these miracles in Sahaja Yogi, you know. <laughs> We've seen a few like this. <laughs> then we, it took many years of research to be able to do the precise calculations and everything. Carol helped a lot because that's a specialty. I spent many, many months at the uh, Guildhall Library going through the microfilms. You know, the, everything was on microfilm and microfiche. Yes. And so it took a long time to do the research, but we got there. We were able to prove not just on vibrations, but on the actual uh, evidence, you know, from the past that this is the location of Blake's grave. We wrote a little study about that. The study was uh, accepted by all the Black scholars worldwide. You know, they agreed with our findings. And then we found out more and more and more. The evidence was so overwhelming. Uh, then the question, yeah, go ahead. Well, the the the, um, the study uh, which included about um, somebody called the Reverend McNeil, who'd also found out about it. Uh, um, Another so we wrote that that study up and Lewis was trying to get um it something in the newspapers about about this because we thought this 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 people will really want to know about this um and really difficult thing to do you know Lewis was phoning up lots of different newspapers and finally got through to the the times for the weekend Saturday times or something and I don't know how this happened obviously mother mother absolutely did it the person who was the art editor there or the art journalist there, um, his um, his grandfather or his great uncle or something had was the Reverend McNeil, the same Hi. person. <laughs> and so he said, "Yes, yes, I want to come and see. I want to come to Bunhill. I want to see your report and everything." But the the the, the little miracle, the, the way I felt it was like this: all the newspapers I 
uh, arranged, in fact, the editors. They told me, no, we are not interested to have a little article about the dis rediscovery of the location of William Blake's grave. They all said no. And uh, the Times was the same. The, the, this was the sub sub editor, not the main editor. Mm -hmm. No way, there's no access to main editors but anyway. Unless you manage to market first. Once you market, yes, we'll be there. That's an event. Yeah. We want to cover the day you can mark the location. Yes, call us. But now we're not interested. And I told him just a little bit more about the whole history of it. you know. And then I mentioned the Reverend McNeil. Did you say Reverend McNeil? Yes, I said Reverend McNeil. He's involved in the discovery also. That's my great-great-grandfather. He said, oh. Well, it's very vital for this project. Oh, in that case, I'm going to go now there with you to the grave and find, see the coincidence, this man, a journalist, he, he had just inherited the, the diary of his great-great-grandfather, who was the Reverend McNeil, who was one of the people who also marked wow. the location of Blake's grave. So this editor didn't want to have an article about the grave of Blake until he found out that his great great grandfather was also one of the men who would discover the grave. Then he was interested. He had just inherited the diary of his, you know, came into his hands and he was trying to write about his father, his great 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 grandfather. He was a very great man, in fact. And so that was a little miracle. You know, I don't know what made me talk of the Reverend McNeil. And when he found out, he's the same one, his ancestor. That's <laughs> at last he got some yeah. agreement for putting this in a newspaper because they didn't want to cover it in newspapers until you actually mark the location not yeah. before and so that was just there was so many little little miracles like this you know that but then that, the next thing was that that it was only printed as quite a small article his editor cut it down a lot he thought it was going to be a full page article in the end it was about this big you see so and then we got a call from um, a gentleman, a, a scholar himself, who phoned and he said, "I've just seen your um, little article in the in the Saturday Times." He said, um, "And I noticed that you are um, just joined the Blake Society as well, and I'm the secretary of the Blake Society." He said, "Would you like to come and join us? We'd like you on our committee." <laughs> so wow. that was because it was so small, <laughs> and. Um, yeah, and, and he knew he was uh, uh, Dr. Kerry Davis, his name is. He knew that one of the great Blake scholars in America, who's called um, uh, Professor uh, Bent, G. E. Bentley Jr. And he's done a huge, very respected um, tome which about Blake, which has got everything in about historically that they've been finding about Blake. He's one of the great reference professors. And um, he sent him our study and he spoke to him on the phone because he knew him and everything. And uh, finally, also, we had a, a letter back from this Professor Bentley. And he said, I would wish that I had done this research, he said, and congratulations, uh, uh, this is absolutely wonderful. And it was a very, very, very kind, sweet letter. And so that was how it became recognized by the Blake um, scholars, scholars worldwide because his reference book is a worldwide used um, uh, scholarly um, reference book. Blake and it's called Blake, Blake Records. Records. It's yes, called the Blake important Records. Book. Very important. And mm -hmm. um, uh, he also said, um, "You must. Um, w we must put this into um, into record within the Blake Records. So within his thing, it needs to be referenced that you found the grave, yeah. and it was it was then. So." Um, in due time, that was also done. So yes. this is how it that was. little article when became was quite miraculous, you know. Another little when miracle. was this done? My mother told us to join the Blake Society. Yeah. Told me to join the Blake Society, but uh, I postponed it a lot. I felt I'm not prepared. I need to learn more. What are they going to think about me? I know I'm not yet ready, you know. So I kept postponing, you know. But in the end, we got the invitation to join the committee straight away. Because of the secretary itself. Because of that little article, you know, so tiny yeah. that article was cut down to nothing, really, about a square inch of, of an article, more or less. So are you, have you been invited, or perhaps you will be invited as guests? 
professors or guest yeah, lecturers on the lake? I became committee members there of the Black Society for 12 years. You know, I was there for 12 years. Sometimes I was secretary, sometimes I was treasurer. Some, you know, so we spent a long time there working with them to, to mark the location. Because the owners of the cemetery, the city of London, they told me, I will not, they will not allow me to mark the location unless I'm a member of the Blake Society. So that's when I remember, oh my God, mother had told me. What so is it? Member of Blake Society? Do you have, I mean, there's no qualification or prerequisite conditions no, you have to meet? What is it? To be on the committee, you have to prove that you have a certain knowledge of William Blake, you know. So, so anyone can sort of cite tales of innocence of experience and does that anyone can join the Blake society but to be invited <laughs> to the committee usually they want someone who did a little bit of research about William Blake or wrote something about William Blake you know and uh -huh. mother asked me to go and help them she told go there and help them you see but I felt I was not prepared see. but uh, out of that little article which was so small came that little miracle we got invited to be on the committee of the Blake society now, Amazing. the city of London made that uh, had made that uh, request. You see, you have to be a, a committee member of the of the Blake Society, or else we cannot uh, allow you to mark the grave. Now we are not even members, live alone committee members, and the city of London they are the owners of the cemetery. They're asking us that I have to be a committee member of the Blake Society, and mother had told me to join it, and I never joined. I never went there. You know. So now we have a problem because you may join the Black Society as an ordinary member, but it would help, it would help a lot if you were on the committee. Yeah. But out of that little newspaper article, you know, we got the invitation straight away to, to, to join the committee. So when I went back to the City of London, I said, right, now you are on the committee of the Black Society. We can uh, do business with you, you know. We can, let's see how can, how, what, what's the process to mark it, you know. It, it was a long process to mark the grave of William Blake there was another legal obstacle. There was a local act of parliament uh, ordering all the grave monuments to be taken away from that lawn. There's that green lawn that you saw there. There was a local yeah. parliament telling, take all the monuments from there and create an, what they called an amenity law, an, an amenity lawn for people to, you know, relax and enjoy the sandwiches at, at, at lunchtime, the people work nearby. Yeah, yeah. So they're asking to put a monument in a location where there is an act of parliament prohibiting monuments there and asking them to be removed. So this was the legal obstacle. But because I was also legal, legally trained, I could see that if you read the whole, the whole act at the end, there are some notes there that give powers to the city of London to take some administrative decisions on, on discretion, you know. So they had some powers. So there was a lot of legal arguments whether you are breaking the law or not, or going against an act of parliament, you know, so the, we were discussing these things for years, you know, with them, but they would not even talk to me unless I was a, a committee member of the Blake Society. And that happened yeah. by a miracle, you know, we got that article, then a phone call invitation, there we are. I wish I had done what Mother said a little earlier, to at least join the Blake Society, but we joined straight to the committee. Well, so, yeah, just kind of helping and making every, everything possible. Yeah. And we needed so much to be on the committee to, to continue to negotiate with the city of London. To and there, there was the formal in sort of recognition of Blake's uh, burial place, wasn't there, some, some years ago now, mm -hmm. where a lot of uh, people went. It, it, took us, it took us 12 years to get permission from the city of London to mark the location. 12 years. years. That's the time it usually takes, they say. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's reminding me of the 14 years that Sri Rama had to go to exile. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's so 12 years. I'm just counting the time since we joined the Blake Society. But we yeah. had researching the location for at least three years or more even before we there tried. you go so <laughs> this was a very long long process to to achieve because there was that obstacle the obstacle was the act the local act of parliament we are infringing an act of parliament here <laughs> so there was a lot of discussions about this whether we can put a monument there or not on that lawn 
So nowadays, in that whole lawn, there's only one monument. Is the is the monument of William Blake? No other. Blake is the only person on the lawn, on the green. That's a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. It's on the edge. Oh, mm. yes. Fantastic tribute, actually. Uh, and hopefully it'll even get better because the amount we spend on uh, mortals in power or positions mm. is just completely incorrect, mm. uh, given you know what we sort of should do to William Blake um, in this country, of course. Mm. I can sort of see how, you know, there's a question about Sahaj marriages. It's very important, I think, towards the conclusion of today's um, session. I can see how Shamasji, of course, being the supreme goddess, you know, is the best, how you two are a good match and how you've just sort of um, complemented each other's skill sets in this project of uh you know William Blake and and keeping William Blake uh alive contemporary and ensuring that there is uh you know it, it remains so uh, with the future generations so that's that's brilliant our, 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 our gratitude and congratulations to you both thank you very much uh, mother, mother did everything mother. <laughs> everything I mean uh, he did he did it all absolutely no doubt Tell us your experience as 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 Sahaj couple. When Shrimathji matched you, married you, what was it like? Because it's 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 not just a, a marriage of two individuals, is it? There's lots lots happening on the surface. Otherwise, tell us something about it, please. Yes. Uh, I think there's a little miracle there also. When uh, I was born in Portugal and uh, we, there was a war for many years, for many long years, we were trying, Portugal was trying to keep the colonies, you know, the African colonies. This was against international law, it was a horrible thing. We didn't want to give independence to those colonies. And so there was a war and the Russians were there, you know, giving weapons to the locals and the Americans were there trying to stop those colonies from going f free and independent because they would turn into communism in those days so this was related to the cold war if those colonies became free they would definitely go go towards communism so the americans didn't want that to become uh, independent because of that reason and so the war was going and we were growing up and we were being uh, brainwashed that you know you have to go and fight in africa kill all the african people so that we can keep our colonies a horrible thing but I was just a kid, I didn't know anything about politics. And they used to ask me, so when you grow up, you want to defend your country, don't you? Yes, yes, yes. So what do you want to do? Do you want to join the Navy, Air Force or military? Which one? You know, and I used to say none of them because I have to go to London to get married. <laughs> really absurd thing to say. I mean, I used to get slaps on the face. What a coward, what a traitor, you know. You don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to defend your country. 